Brian. The organisms for this uh, piece of work here at Jean Naturel, which I call Fist Save Mop Bait. One is an algae, Sinecococcus 7002. I think it's an industry um, bioalgae fuels algae that's used. Um, it leaks sugar, or it leaks lactase, uh, hydrogenase, so it can't hold its energy, and therefore it sucks sunlight continually. It's like a bee with its ass cut off. I mean, it's sort of like can't feed enough. It's always hungry, and therefore it's a production of sugar. And by micro-injecting it into Casper embryos, which are zebrafish embryos that are not albino, they're albino cross-bred with a zebrafish that has no iridescence, um, the so-called Roy Orbison mutant. Um, so Casper is the progeny of Roy Orbison, and Casper the ghost, it's a ghost fish, it's a glass fish. And so the sunlight should go through it into the algae and then provide a sugar source. And Hub de Chot, who, who I um, work with, he, he said, he's a biophysicist, he said, if there's an energy source, the body will follow. It's a very Spinoza thing to say. Um, he also told me they think of cows as a sphere covered with a small layer of milk. Um, and then the third organism is my favorite. I'll just take a minute. Um, the bipolar flower, we use zinc finger constructs. We, we attach them to some vectors. Um, zinc fingers are a new way of altering a genome. They don't just alter one gene, they alter hundreds of genes. They fall all over the genome anywhere there's a certain nine base pair um, sequence. So this one that we chose has 524 places where some some genes can be either up or down regulated. And we chose to up and down regulate them at the same time with two competing vectors. I don't know if that's Greek for you, but let me say it this way. If we're changing the expression patterns of the genome, the whole genome of the plant in 524 places, and some of them are up regulated and some of them are down regulated, then actually every cell of the plant has a different moray pattern or mosaic of these up and down regulators, it's really sort of screwing up the plant rather strongly. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of videos online. I interviewed the scientist that does this, and I interview, and we actually show the making of the plants in the lab, thanks to Zot and Jeanette. Um, and uh, I don't love this process. It's something I have a love-hate relationship with, but I did like making an organism or a plant that wasn't able to be defined by science, it wasn't utilizable. So it becomes an enigmatic organism, or uh, it's something that's important in the arts, but also um, it's interesting. I look forward to seeing how the risk for that organism is assessed, since it's sort of a, an unknown what it is. Um, putting these organisms in the aerarium, um, there's a light and sound Differential. Obviously, we worked a lot. I don't know if you can tell. A lot of you haven't seen it before, but we worked the whole last week on containment, on getting this sort of near triple containment. There's still more to go. We have to cover the gloves because everyone wants to touch everything, but um, and lock it with a chain. Uh, but other than that, um, it seems like that part of it will pass the permit process. Now we applied for a permit through the ministry to let these genetically modified organisms and experimental organisms live inside of the aerarium so the public can change the light and sound, again, in a non-repeatable way, but they can alter their, their, uh, alter their gene expression patterns as well, which are altered by light and sound and input of any kind. But give them, it's a question if we're giving them stress or enriching them. It's really not up to us to decide that, but up to the organisms. We've been talking about actually the ecological effects of genetically modified organisms. Uh, sometimes some of the speakers have said they're, it's negligible. I obviously feel a little differently. It's something to take care. We also talked very little, but about um, 
whether or not these organisms are still beings to have some 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 sense of dignity, even if we're going to eat them. <laughs> it might be nice to say thanks. I, I don't know. Um, when it comes to patenting, um, and especially when it comes to public research uh, or, or public partnerships with corporate, the corporations with the algae that are coming in here are having sort of like a fiesta, a, a drag race to see who's got the best algae for the market. And the scientists are helping them uh, race them in different fermentation devices. Um, I would think at least half of the patents that come out of biosolar cells should go to the public domain if it is a public-private partnership. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think they get sold to the highest bidder, um, the corporations investing, getting the first crack at them. Um, and then I guess we just have to talk about reindustrialization and neocolonialism a little bit, uh, since we're trying to cover the earth with a new great technology, but we also want to retake all arable and non-arable land, actually cover the earth. So on our second or third, or I don't know how many waves it's been. Uh, I don't know, let's see, let's see how we go. Adam mentions um, three um, issues that we can discuss. And a number of these are also uh, mentioned earlier this, uh, this uh, in the morning. Um, uh, one of uh, one is the uh, the ecological risk and the effects on the environment and where we can do a risk assessment and what, what what would be the potential risk and how can you do a risk assessment? Um, this was also mentioned uh, by Paul. Okay, um, so this we sh should discuss this. Um, the problem of uh, reindustrialization and uh, neocolonization. I think we should really cover that as well and then if there's time left we can have it we can talk about the uh, patenting and perhaps even also the sense of uh, uh, dignity of these new altered organisms um paul i'd like to start with you because uh, you were the one that also mentioned during your talk um that in the past two, 20 years uh, our whole idea of risk analysis um, maybe should be re we thought of because we know so much more and we learn so much more and you say this is really really um, a big problem um, but do you, how do you feel about this work of uh, Adam I don't know if I understand completely what you're doing I don't know if you understand yourself Adam um, yes yeah. Adam um, we are doing these type of experiments also in mice um, Adam is using zinc finger nucleases to mutate endogenous genes. And normally, if you use zinc finger nucleases, you try to be as specific as possible. And in his approach, in Adam's approach, this specificity is loosened, thereby creating the possibility that you don't uh, target one specific gene, but a bunch of genes. Now, in itself, zinc, zinc finger nucleases are specific if you have the right sequence and you have the right proteins to do it. But um, there is a prob problem in specificity anyway. So if you lose in the specificity, the chance that you hit many genes is real. So in that sense, I think the plan is okay. Because that's what you want, right? Yeah. yeah. And then see what these zinc fingers are doing, of what these genes that you mutate are doing, the mutation does to the uh, physiological uh, behavior of your organism. Now, what we do in, in mice is more or less the same. What we do, we don't use nucleases there, but if we use nucleases, then we try to be as specific as possible. But another system is the transposon system. And the transposon system is also a system which, that you can use to elevate expression or reduce expression or inactivate genes even. Um, based on hopping of mobile elements in the genome and they land somewhere in a gene, either upstream, downstream or within the gene, and thereby you can knock it out, you can elevate expression, you can reduce expression and you look for the consequences of that. And this is a fishing expedition because we try to find genes that are involved in the progression of cancer, for instance. So you start out with cancer and then you use the, the transposon system and the mice that show progression of the disease, they are interesting because they have 
transposons, which you can identify and also find where they landed, they have transposons in relevant genes. That's the way we use those um, at random mutation. Uh, but you would only do this in a laboratory? With we do this only in the laboratory. The organism. Mostly, these mutations will be silent. You don't, no, you don't um, see them because the conditions are not appropriate to see the effect. In other situations, which, which you don't know, they will pop up. And then you get also selection for the plants that can survive. And so, in itself, it's a nice experiment, but I would do that in containment, because then you have the full control what is happening. And you can mimic the situations, of course, which are encountered also in, in, the, free, in, in, in the wild. If you can mimic that, that's, that's also fine. So on a scientific basis, I think it's a nice experiment. But you do understand that he was not giving a permit to exhibit it. I don't know the... Uh, oh, well, I mean, <laughs> I can talk. The permit is... We're right now... What's that? We're waiting to find out if we get signatures for the permit. I think the signatures may come. They may not. Um, we have one person who said they would be willing to sign, and one person who had some worries about the embryos, not the plant. And that's a minister of agriculture? Yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting. There is... Yeah. So I, um, but I, I, uh, this whole genome reprogramming with zinc fingers is actually, it is this multi-gene expression pattern alteration, and without vectors, it can be applied to flowers, um, and change their genome in many, many places yeah. at, at once. At once. Um, and it's not regulated yet because uh, it's not genetic modification; it's gene expression re patterning or whole genome, I call it whole genome fracking. Um, and it's a protein therapy, which hasn't caught up to litigation yet. So it's a, you know, here's if, if you're thinking activism. Um, I, I would like to ask uh, Peter a question. I think you're, you're not that enthusiastic about this whole... Uh, not that, that. It's um, completely outside my territory. I know nothing about any of these um, uh, subjects or investigations. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got involved in Yad Naturlik, I thought I was going to get involved in something to do with uh, nature and something to do with as we know it, uh, not as we're trying to make it, and also something to do with... Uh, Ecology, at least I saw Mark Dion and myself and uh, uh, Ursula Beam is concerned with the Nile River. And I think uh, um, I know I have not investigated or studied um, whatever you're doing, and uh, fine, good. Um, I am generally alarmed by the, and I'll try to address it broadly, we have an ecology problem on the planet. We are destroying the planet. Species are disappearing at a record rate. We have, as, a, as was mentioned already, the, the rise in uh, uh, CO2. Maybe these technologies will work, but very possibly they won't because they will not be pan-geographic enough in time. How do you, maybe just try to be constructive here, how what you do how is it that what you do can possibly be applied in time to deal with the planetary problem of drought, CO2 rise, uh, polar meltdown, and so on? And the need to change the hydrocarbon base, the need to change the uh, uh, hydropower base, and the need to, I would dare say, phase out nuclear. How are you going to deal with that in time enough? Okay. Adam? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm also not sure most of our mutants that we make in the lab, A, are designed for a particular, uh, whether it's profitable or just pure research-based drive to tweak one variable. Uh, there are some pure research techniques that are fishing expositions, but we're looking for mutants that are in general, in general utilizable by industry or at least curious enough to get a paper out of. And I do believe that some of the scientists that are interested in <coughs> enhancing or increasing photosynthesis, making it more uh, a better collector, um, are, are thinking that will help more than just the economy, but help us transfer over from petroleum because it'll make algae bio farming more cost effective. There are people that actually think that 
the way things are priced may be, um, how do I say, a monopoly game where most of us are just losers. So, I mean, uh, I would say that oil is underpriced and bioalgae fuel might be able to function just fine, right, um, without increasing photosynthesis. I'm not sure if increasing photosynthesis in microorganisms is a good idea. I do think if we want to increase photosynthesis in humans, it's a better idea because we can give our volition, but also because maybe maybe we need a different energy source ourselves. Um, maybe we could utilize our own metabolism as a factory <clears throat> instead of re-industrializing the earth. Uh, is total uh, an exon? Uh, are, are total an exon paying for that particular investigation? <laughs> I do. I, I get some small iota uh, of of uh, the funds that they've given to biosolar cells um, through quite a few loops that take their take all the way down to the trickle that I get. But um, I don't think that they are. No, I don't think that but they're also interested in um, anything but keeping. But two of you. Yeah. Do not do not believe that technology can solve this problem, and and don't you see that? Uh, don't you feel maybe that uh, because all this focus on the technolo technological fix of this problem, that the the, the real uh, solution uh, change in behavior uh, uh, worldwide um, gets a bit uh, uh, lack of attention. Um, that we want to believe that technology will fix this for us, but in fact we have to do something else, change our behavior. Uh, Peter, make it, maybe you can. Say something, and then we can ask Paul. I mean, oh. for myself personally, I <laughs> I'm not sure that we, as a species, are capable of stopping because I think there's some sort of um, impetus, at least in the culture that we're driving in, and all of the cultures that seem to have come about seem to need to get themselves knocked down from some external force, whether it's the need to prove that there's a god or the need to prove some sort of um, human sin factor, you know? Uh, it's like the Tower of Babel all over again. So I'm not sure if we stop what we're doing in time. Um, but I'm interested if we're just changing our behavior to perpetuate a system that is actually um, causing some of this eco-catastrophe, whether or not that's a good investment do you agree, Peter? Uh, okay, just trying to overview the situation. Um, first, almost everything that I have been promoting, for example, is already established science. It's been published by somebody, actually researched by somebody, uh, whether it's at Caltech or in Norway or whatever. It's nothing, nothing that mysterious. Uh, in fact, I think we can generally say that a great deal of science has already been achieved, uh, in, say, in ecology or... Uh, fermentation of, uh, of algae to make methane gas or whatever. Uh, the application of these ideas on a broad scale, for example, in that I think interesting local project for Nordbrabant and Zeeland, the application of those, those technologies uh, truly throughout the whole uh, region, including the entire, in this case, Moss and scaled river basins, um, has yet to be done. And the application of technologies uh, to whether it's California, Chile, Argentina, or wherever, uh, has yet to be done. The, um, the main experience I've had in my, say, 35 years of career has been that time and again, somebody will block an application of obvious technology. Not just me, but other scientists. Again and again, there were this Dr. Wheeler North at Caltech, or two French scientists who pioneered the algae industry in France in 1971. <clears throat> There's always some vested interest somewhere stepping in and saying no. So that what needs to occur generally is some way someplace, somehow, whereby known ecological and biological science uh, together, I dare say, with paradigms from art, like the kinds I, I showed, can be brought to bear in an entire geographical region and proven to work. Paul, if, I, if, if, you, if you compare your field of biology with their field of biology, th there is a big difference. I mean, within in, in your field, um, do you recognize this this? This feeling that there, that's, that your um, that results are being blocked and that there, there's a block between research to what what is the major bit difference between the two fields? It is for sure it's different in our science um, than in your science. That's true. 
Car science is, has support all over. Nobody will stop us. Nobody dares to say, what are you doing? I don't want this. <coughs> Whereas in, in, in the other fields of science, I think they are much more um, yeah, uh, commercially driven arguments and also um, regional arguments. Um, and it's not a threat to uh, people personally, individual people. Uh, I'd, just, I'd like to just interject an anecdote to show you what I mean and maybe how it agrees. In, in the year 2000, after a show at the University of Chicago, I was then invited by the Lilly Foundation uh, for $2 million, which is for an artist some kind of money, to do work on the kind of thing you saw in the image. A guy from Houston flew up from Houston to Indiana to stop that grant. His name is Richard Hout. You can look him up on the web, W-H-A-U-T. He works for Exxon and Halliburton. And Richard Hout is a specialist in drilling in the Arctic. They don't want anybody get, figuring out how to make energy from a locality. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, so on a small scale, also, grants are not given in, in, in our size, of course. There's competition. And some of the, I think some of the technologies that Peter is talking about would be, and they aren't very well funded, and they probably should be, is like, Permaculture, like reliance on perennials. I didn't hear anybody talking about preserving topsoil today. Maybe a different issue, but it seems like we're going for crops that need plowing. Absolutely. Um, giving back enormous tracts of lands to non-humans, not allowing people in, even with their ATVs, their, you know, uh, and also slow tech and low tech. I don't see them getting 600 million euro, right? For we could do a lot with slow tech with 600 million, we could slow down a lot. Um, and in particular, I don't mean to, it's a rough place to say it, because I'm from the US and we're in Europe and I know you have more experience with this, but population, like if we took all the money from the Fortune 500 companies and gave every person willing to get a vasectomy 100,000 bucks, we'd have this problem solved in like 45 years, right? It's like really simple. So there's other ways. Now, I don't know what kind of funding that would take, but we'd have a lot of a different funding schema after that. But do I understand to conclude that that you feel that the problem is the big companies? <laughs> and I, I don't mean the big companies per se. I think the problem is uh, oil companies. I'll just say criminality. Uh, the fact that they would fly up and stop a grant from a foundation is essentially a mafia. Um, the fact, and I can go on a long list of cr criminal behavior by uh, various entities vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, art initiatives or initiatives that or somehow seem to be threatening to their turf. Uh, I think the point is that, um, and I say this with some pain, but I, I think that the, well, there are a number of alternatives. One has, one has, one can either go to a certain countries where there's room uh, or, and I don't mean the USA, by the way. Uh, or one can uh, uh, expose and sh uh, shout out the, the abuses. Uh, but uh, we need to understand that human beings uh, are uh, essentially thieves. Um, they will steal and lie and cheat and kill however they can, whether it's imperially or otherwise. And there's nothing honorable about uh, uh, any major uh, accumulation of power. And so it's going to be a dog-eat-dog -dog and f a big battle. And I, I think to pretend that various entities now in power are somehow good is, is uh, naive. Um, my experience in general is that whoever is in power will do whatever they can to retain that power uh, and usually will do so uh, in abuse of the law. So does, then we will just um, head towards a cat catastrophe. Well, we have to have a, a, a expo a exposure and other, we have to have exposure and other methods of uh, combat, yeah. Yeah, if, if going uh, around um, them. I, I'd like to refer to the first lecture of this morning by uh, Huib de Vriend. It was one of the, I don't know where he is now. Uh, oh, there. <laughs> it was one of the questions I asked him. Uh, how did you get uh, around the table with these uh, with these companies? And you were very optimistic that, that uh, he said I, I, we, we succeeded. Because uh, I think in the end the, the, they could find some kind of win-win situation, I, I suppose, that there was a mutual gain for both the local uh, initiatives and, and the bigger companies. Do, do, do you feel that something, or do you think that he's naive? Am I only, okay, I, I'm probably the oldest person or one of the oldest people around here, and I only can tell that time and time and time again I've been surprised by the level of abuse of power by those in power. 
right here in this country, um, uh, General Berikov, who is uh, your head of the um, Western Union Group, uh, Western European Union, I, I think. Anyway, he was a leading general in your country. Worked very, very hard to have our satellite study of the Iran-Iraq War published in the NRC Handelsblatt in a false way. And I beat him to the punch by getting it into the Ryan Adelon with the real story, the true story. And I can verify that with something happening at the UN later on. But, you know, he was doing what he could to defend the interests of a vested power to prevent people from knowing what's really happening in the Iran-Iraq war. This happens all the time. You constantly run into, if you have a satellite image showing what's really going on, you'll see somebody somewhere doing whatever they can to try to hide that fact from the public. And this goes on also with uh, uh, the, uh, say, the drought or the, the various forms of uh, uh, decline of the planet. Uh, there is always an attempt to cover up and to re and, and then to find ways of funding. Why? Because people want to find ways of having property. The, the real, I was a, and I'll try to be positive here, the real challenge is to establish property in locality. For example, in that, I thought, very heartening project in, in Zeeland, whereby the locality is determining what happens with its resources and therefore has a pan-ecological approach and can integrate some of the things you're doing and whatever into their overall program. As long as we have a commodity-based uh, production of wealth uh, from the nature, we will have a situation which is more and more or less denying to the diversity we need in our ecosystems. Adam? Um, well, I mean, first off, I would, I would just ask, like, because it's so hard, because this is so much about sustainability and green production, et cetera, I would, I would wonder, like, how many people think that Exxon uh, would be the best place to turn for security for the future of our environment? Well, it's not possible. I, I, I mean, I don't mean to force the question, but I don't see a whole lot of hands. It's, it's, a, it's a question as to whether or not it's just accumulation of wealth that's the only problem. No, it's not the only problem. But I would say that um, if you're asking all on the ground people, like citizens of the planet, to be more austere because we're running out of money, uh, and <laughs> how do you say, it's, a, it's, it's, it's sort of obscure. We, one of the behaviors we might have to change might have to be on a sociological level and not a psychological behavioral level. And that sociological level might be the end of global competition. I don't know how to get nations to stop trying to beat each other at the same game and reinvent and protect all their property, but you, it, would, you it would be nice. You can't, you, can't, I'm sorry. you can't change human nature. I think human beings are where they are. Uh, all you can really do is try to change the game. You need funding to do your work because there's no, uh, you, 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 you can't live from the air. And when I ask where do you get your money from, well, there is no money coming from the government anymore because in the Netherlands, uh, uh, the, the, for art, for art, yes. Yeah, well, but but maybe also increasingly for science that, that that the government is promoting young scientists and artists to go for private capital. There, they are. Uh, you have to knock on the door of these companies. So maybe uh, you're you're very cynical, but no, I'm if not cynical. you're realistic, there <laughs> oh. are other companies. Okay, the other companies. So no, we. No, oh, okay, what what are these companies? What other co companies oh, should be be addressed? Concretely, uh, the, Italian, the Italian oil company uh, is a very likely candidate for the kind of projects I propose, as against uh, any internationally intercarburetor in, in Italy. They can work in competition with Exxon. The way to beat a dinosaur is to get another dinosaur to fight that dinosaur. You don't fight all dinosaurs. You find someone who's going to be an enemy of the other co uh, uh, enemy to fight that enemy. So any, for example, has very good uh, attitude towards hydrocarbons and biohydrocarbons. And if you get, get them to work off the coast of Tunisia or the co off the coast of Labrador and the kind of things I was showing and the kind of things you, you, even you were talking about, that scares the hell out of Exxon. You, you don't... Well, I was saying any, internationally Intercarburetor, the Italian oil company. Now, I'm not trying to glorify them. It's that you take one against the other. I think most people in this audience have never heard of this company. <laughs> Emma, does, that, does that anybody know this company? They're like the seventh largest oil company in the world. Huh? Okay. Uh, Adam, is that also your strategy? <laughs> uh, I think you wanted to say something. I'm oh, I, okay, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, it's so different from pharma, I guess. Uh, so uh, different yeah. from pharma. Yeah. And of course, in pharma, you have also these big, big companies. 
like Pfizer and Sanofi Aventis, and they are really big, not as big as the oil companies, but still. If you have to talk to them, you talk first to a very low level, so scientists among each other. And it's much easier to, to discuss things that we are coping with in, in healthcare, in, in medicine, and so on, with these guys. And when it goes up to the higher levels, of course, of course then it's going to be difficult. But there are many projects running in our institute that are paid by these pharma. And of course, they have their protection and they have their IP rights. But first, they, the, the first IP rights are from us. They are using our science. So there's a lot of, there's much more collaborative uh, actions between pharma and um, healthcare um, and fundamental research than in, in the other areas of the, of the industry. So maybe a little bit naive, but also a little bit more optimistic. And that's what it may be the same. Eh? Yeah. Not necessarily. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I mean, I'm familiar with fermentation from really early on. I worked in a fermentation lab, and I know that it's the same in some ways, whether you're making drugs or you're making vitamins or you're making yogurt or you're making beer. It's the same process. Even making fuel from algae is a fermentation process. Or a, a, what is it called? Pyro... Anyhow, I, I, I'm kind of interested in this rendering of life. So in other words, if we grow algae on a contained algae farm that's GMO to increase the photosynthesis and we get to somewhere higher than that 6%, and then we also throw in a gene for it to make some drugs to fight cancer or to fight mental illness, and we also use what's left over after it's squeezed for oil and squeezed for drugs to burn or to you know send back to the central grid or even to feed to humans and so we have this sort of weird residue i think maybe this uncomfortable feeling that people have that somehow something's not right with their food chain from you know from the bench the lab bench to market or with their even with their medicines um and in certainly with their and their fuel supply, even though we all are using fuel and drugs and f eating that food, there's some queasiness. And I think a lot of it has to do with a detachment from the cycle of life, that people aren't doing their own farming and making their own herbal drugs and that sort of thing. But I also think that there is reason to believe that there might be residues that cross over in every direction. And I kind of do like the idea that maybe our maybe our cancer maps could be fixed by not leaking all these toxins so, you know on every river and every ocean, but also maybe maybe we could come up with a way to to help everything like antidepressants in our oil in our cars that slowly sort of like vaporize the world into complacency. Um, because yeah, it, I wouldn't at least like that at all. Sorry. You uh, don't like that. No, I don't want Nobody anybody depressed anymore. Money. No, and no. and by the way, about fermentation, that's another aspect. You you have now these mega brewing companies, Heineken, InBev, uh, and uh, um, a few others coming along. Uh, Philip Miller, uh, so they can do that kind of thing we're talking about, and they can essentially supplant the oil companies. Uh, by having local brewing in localities. I, my point is that one has has to be aware of the fact that any coalescence of power will be uh, either an enemy or a tool or an ally. And, and you have to figure out which allies to, to, to work with. But not to accept, uh, in any case, not to accept the existing order as uh, the one that works because it's not. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 it's becoming near uh, three o'clock. I I, um, I want to give the audience also uh, a chance to ask some questions. I have another question. Uh, I want I'd like to refer to the subtitle of the um, uh, the Ja natuurlijk, the Yes naturally, um, and that's probably also why you are sitting here. How art saves the world. And uh, we have two artists at the table, and we have two we? very uh, critical audience at, at the table as well. Um, can, can you give me, um, can, can, you, can you give me the, and the audience an, um, an idea how you feel that you, as an artist, um, can make a difference when you talk about the problems you you, you just? Uh, uh, I, I think maybe I rushed through my presentation too fast, but I was trying to show art works from the past um, century that uh, our paradigm is for saving the world. In, in other words, uh, well, for example, that image I showed of the ocean uh, organized planet has been requested by scientists to be used by them and said, well, no, you have to pay for it, you know? But it is based on an art concept. 
and uh, almost everything I do is based on some art practice somewhere or other by some artist. And I think that uh, in general, we have to recognize uh, anthropologically that in any human society, no matter whether it's cave time or now our time, artists, for whatever reason, I don't know how, do seem to germinate those images or paradigms that are useful when applied scientifically to the world. And we should pay more respect to art in that manner, because um, uh, that's how we're going to, quote, save the world. Uh, Earth art, or land art as we call it, is going to be very important to looking at the land in terms of its wild systems and so on. So we're not only having the we-centric approach to making something for uh, a disease or something for a fuel. We need to deal very very really with the terrain of the planet, both land and sea, um, because uh, that is crumbling. And we can use art for that. Yeah, and, and um, Adam, how would you... Um, you work in labs. Uh, yeah. uh, different, uh, your, your, your scope's slightly different than... <laughs> Peter, yeah. of course. Yeah, it's slightly, yeah. Um, I mean, I have... Do you have did you feel attracted to the subtitle? Uh, do you feel that you, with your artwork... Can... I have, this, I have the weird pleasure and strange sort of like growing pain of growing up in Woodstock, New York. So I have like hippie parents and I'm sort of a red diaper baby, but I also saw the seventies and saw how the, we have competing conspiracy theories, you know, like how the, how the government changed from pot and LSD to, um, brought cocaine into the hippie movement to stop it. And it turned into the me generation. And I, I have a little punk edge. I remember the yippies were actually active and not just like a Volkswagen with a flower in it. And they were actually doing some shit. I guess it's your Provo movement I'm talking about here. But like, um, uh, there was, there, I do have some things to say about, you know, still we're looking for a cure for AIDS so we can have an orgy in the street, right? Like, like 6,000 people in the middle of Amsterdam fucking. That's why we want the cure for AIDS. We have to remember. So it's about the end to frugality and the addition of fecundity or fertility that I think we need to lead towards. So there's no, there's no way that we can get to an ecological stable point without having a festival of ecological stability. Vasectomies and orgies. Yeah, that's a great, so you know. No kids, but plenty of sex. Yeah, it does sound good. Um, other than that, I mean, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, I, a the, bunch of hippies. Yeah, well, that's all right. I mean, I just, I want to re-include, I just don't think that we can, we can solve the ecological footprint of the human race by, um, T getting our asses tighter. That, that's part of the problem. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, change, how do I say, uh, mutation does happen. Like I'm sort of a pro-mutation person, so I can't be totally anti-GMO because I like difference. I like, I think of the humans that are perpetuating mutagenesis and focalizing difference through their laboratories and their organisms are getting free whether it's through the fda or just escaping in the air and nobody knows because it's stuck on your shoe fda, FDA. do they know food and drug administration yeah well the scientists know yeah yeah but i mean uh, this sort of like this cogem or a different permit per permitting and like we say the permits are getting looser as we realize that we know less you said that yourself, and I'm interested in multifactorality and alternative editing and the idea that an organism is a whole organism, not just a single gene affecting a single protein production, but actually a, a maze, a web that interacts with the environment. Um, so when it comes to radical mutation, we do have a price to pay eventually, It'll, and we won't know where it came from or how it happened, and maybe we can try and fix it in the same way that we caused it. But I don't think that we know what we're doing, and I don't think that's necessarily bad. This is the weird thing, maybe for me. I don't think that's necessarily a problem, because I'm a little bit non-anthropocentric. So in other words, we're conduits for change, and no matter what we think we're doing for the economy, the bio-based economy, the prevalence of Europe, and you know, uh, the ability to serve China, et cetera, Whatever we think we're doing for the common good, if that's what that is, um, isn't actually what we're doing. We're actually jazz. We're jumping genes. We're jazz. We're actually disorder. Um, so we're creating disorder in the name of order, in the name of reason. So our project itself is more like a Miles Davis to me 
than, say, craft work. Okay, oh, Paul, you make a career out of making genetically engineered, uh, en yeah. genetically well, engineered organisms. Um, I don't think you. I have to say something You're not to doing it. jazz. Hmm? No, <laughs> and the, the human species is the only species that is not jumping, because we we accept all the mutations, whereas in wildlife, all the mut mutations that are negative, they are selected selected against, so they won't. Not all. Not all, well, most of them. Do most think, of them. Do you think? <laughs> do you think sitting at a desk for 40 hours a week watching a computer screen isn't a fitness test? <laughs> you still there? Well, I'm still here. I mean, a anybody here in, the, in, in this audience has some mutation, and in, in the wild, that mutation would be selected against, and that's not what we're doing. We maintain all these mutations. No, I don't understand that. Isn't it true that in evolution there are mutations and sometimes the mutation works? And many times it doesn't, but it's not always selected against. We, no, we, we when, when the circumstances now. changes, then many, many individuals will be wiped out. And we have no natural selection anymore. No, That's what not you're at all. suggesting. Not at all. So we are, gene genetically wise, we are yeah. trashy. Yeah. Not jazzy, but trashy. We maintain everything. This is a Huxley eugenics argument, but it's also, I mean, it's social Darwinism, so we should have more competition. Is economic, no, no, I, I don't. Does economic competition actually, like, equal a fitness test? Because I'm, I'm kind of confused. I thought it would be, like, running really hard up a mountain or something like that, or not getting hit by lightning. I, I also agree that, that in our genome is flexibility, and a lot of what we have in industrial culture is a kind of fitness test. Like, for instance, being carcinogen resistant. No, but it, the selection is not, not in the human species, selection is not individually, individual anymore. It's just based on groups of people, based on societies. And when a society meets problems, general problems, better than another society, then it has more chance. And the, yeah. But isn't this exactly the reason why we need molecular bio biologists like you to repair those human genes or to understand the... Because there are so many mutations? Is that, is that the reason why we all have cancer? Well, get cancer? Uh, most of the mutations do not harm. There are a few mutations that do harm and we try to help the individuals that have these mutations, not the progeny of these, of these people. Not That's not the progeny of these people because we don't know if the progeny has those mutations so why why treat them beforehand so we are now treating people at the individual basis and that's why we are looking for all kinds of treatments yeah. in cancer research we're not helping the human species as a, as a species no not at the uh, moment no not at all doing, not at no. all no back to nature back to nature um i think uh, I would like to uh, ask the audience if they want to comment or have a question. I have a question to uh, Peter Fent. Uh, you said that you were concerned, uh, engage yourself with nature as we know it. Um, can you elaborate a bit on that? Because I just can, cannot understand what, what this concept nature as we know it would mean. It sounds well, to me. Maybe I was being rather. Um, it sounds to me very anthropocentric and romantic. No, I don't think it's anthropocentric at all. I think it's based on a very simple truism that we all know from ecology that if you were to have large numbers of, and we talked about this, large numbers of wild animals uh, in the on planet, uh, talk about whales, dolphins, buffalo, bi um, beaver, and so on, the animals I named, and um, the kind of animal uh, symbolized by Mark Dye in sculpture, um, in the habitat, uh, the chances of our surviving are, are, are greater. I mean, you simply cannot expect to have survival. I don't think you can expect to have survival of the human species if we're surrounded by uh, almost no birds or fish or, as uh, uh, to, to a green forest pointing out, no sturgeon in the Daniel River. Uh, we're just talking about making sure there's a, a lot of pretty uh, uh, evolutionarily advanced animals and plants out there in the terrain, uh, as we so-called know it. That's not being romantic. I think that's just a truism about survival. Uh, at least that's, uh, I guess I believe that if you have a reduction of the terrain more and more to monoculture, uh, it, the chances of the wipeout of the species becomes greater. I have a question for Adam. <laughs> 
Uh, I was wondering, could you elaborate a bit more uh, on the design of the Errorarium? Because uh, at, uh, you want the public to relate to the plants and the, the zebrafish embryos in it. And at the same time, there's a lot going on visually and with sound and touch. So can you explain a bit more how these two relate to each other in the, in the artwork? The Errorarium was designed to help people feel as if they were communicating with non-humans, but also to make them wonder whether or not they were fooled into experimenting on plants or embryos or um, different mixed species. Um, so it's sort of like a double bind. One, that you can't get your hands off that analog synthesizer. It's a light and sound synthesizer. It sounds good. It's trancy. People enjoy playing with it. And people want to touch. But to that, um, when given a chance to experiment, even people that may be against animal or plant experimentation and these sorts of things seem to want to get their hands on it first and then wonder what they did, which is sort of strange. Um, I don't know if that's a good relation or a bad relation. It's sort of like a relation, relationship between um, giving love and giving stress. Sometimes, I mean, that's a relationship. That's what relationships are. Um, Number two, I, I, I did spend the last week containing, maybe even we're close to triple containing um, this space just to put a plant and some fish embryos with algae in them that, um, you know, if we get our permit, that'll be their home, maybe even their grave, right? Or they'll be taken back to Leiden to be euthanized before they're too old for the kind of permit we have. But to me, using things like uh, an enema for irrigation and butt plugs for gaskets and using all this black rubber and um, you know nasty nasty different kinds of silicon glues um, and making these glove pass through boxes for containment one my dad was a behaviorist and he raised me in a skinner crib an air crib which is like um, a sterile hood it's like, it's made for the baby, but, you know, it was sort of like a replacement for the crib, the jail, that, you know, it was a new kind of jail. Um, so I think I'm just trying to get home. You know, that's one, one thing. So I'm like feeling these organisms as being inside this double tube inside a box, which I think the double tube is a human. And so maybe these solar zebrafish and these plants represent the microbiome of a human that's just a tube in a tube connected to the outside world through a contained box. But um, I would say this, just to confound it a little more, is that um, I talked to Wes Jackson. He's from the Land Institute. And he's trying to make perennial grains. Um, he's trying to make them not through genetic engineering, but he does do some tissue culture to mix perennial weeds with wheat and other, other um, crops so that we won't have to plow anymore. And he came and saw one of my containment, my early containment sculptures where I lived in a clean room for a week. And it, I was making fun of um, biosphere and sort of like this idea that we can always leave the planet. I'm not so sure that we can. Um, but um, he said, if it gets this far, it's too late. So if we think of this aerarium as a place to live, um, that's, it's not that helpful. What is the force of art for you both? And specifically, a question for Adam. Why is it so important to use and to go into the lab and to use scientific uh, instruments, scientific methods to, to, uh, um, as, as a strategy uh, for, for you as an artist? So I'm just trying to tear, tear up some open ground for talk. Um, so it's true I don't always have a, I don't always have a message. I have a, f I, I aid in fragmentation um, of issues, but um, I do sometimes lead the witness. So that's that's a bias. I have some some authoritarian there. Um, as far as entering the laboratory, I want to understand, not from just a knee-jerk reaction. I grew up sort of anti-GMO, and then I went to labs and I found out what I was afraid of wasn't a real fear, and that there are bigger fears to be afraid of once you go and find out what's really going on. Um, practicing protocols and understanding the methodology, even the meticulousness, the mindset of scientists, which I don't have a problem with. Um, I kind of like it. It's cool. And then trying to understand 
sometimes something that the scientists that are producing these processes and practicing them, to me it's almost like a religion, um, don't understand the social implications um, in the same way that I could, even the social implications of the actions, like pipetting, you know. Um, and then I, I just try to comment and make an art that brings the commentary into the corpus of the art, um, the body of the organism, and then um, bring it to a, the public partly to demystify and understand and partly to um, just let the public decide for themselves what they feel because I don't, I don't really want to be a demagogue. It's art, come on, but also um, different people are going to get something else from it than I, that I, I wouldn't have guessed, so I have to leave that open. Uh, I will say I do, I do want to be a demagogue. Uh, also, that I don't think I'm doing art. I think I'm doing architecture. Uh, by demagogue, I just said something you mean someone who is uh, broadcasting a message that will be adopted uh, on a large scale politically. Um, I find the art world very frustrating. Uh, I have been more or less forced to be in the art world because uh, my attempt to be in the media world, uh, as I mentioned with the Dutch general and so on, has been really frustrated by various interests. I mean, CIA, whatever. Now, um, I think art is a source of ideas. Put together with science can then lead to architecture. Uh, if you uh, read a source, it's uh, Alberti writing in his 10 books on architecture that the, the, the fundamental pro uh, challenge of architecture, the responsibility of architecture, is to assure for a, an, an inhabited area, a city, for example, clean air, quality water, living water, um, circulatory space, uh, getting around, and defense. And um, anything I do with fuel is just to assure clean air. Anything I do with earth art and earthworks and so on and water wheels and so on is to have uh, viable water. Um, these architectural requirements are what I address. Uh, I happen to be in the art world because uh, A, is not really taught in architecture schools today, uh, and B, attempts to gain power as I have made have been blocked by this and that power. I am contemplating moving uh, to or at least trying some things out in uh, countries that are uh, anti-fracking explicitly and have good resources like Romania uh, or again maybe, well, let's just say Romania for now. Uh, I've worked in Montenegro. I think that to achieve the kind of terrain changes we need, one has to look to areas other than the current jurisdictions of power. Uh, that's kind of a truism of, our, of a cultural history. Uh, I don't think it's going to be possible in the USA as we have it now under Obama or, um, for that matter, in, in Western Europe in its pursuit of the perfect life. I think that's not possible. I have a question for Adam as well. Um, you mentioned uh, human nature and how, uh, how this is not going to change. Also, you mentioned um, that this, auster uh, this austerity program is, uh, won't work. Um, and we shouldn't want it anyway, because, well, we need, um, to put it nicely, uh, to fuck around. And um, I guess there's, a, there's a, a good deal of truth in there. Um, but I wonder if, if not the problem would be that we got used to use um, big oil to fuck around. And that we need to fly to, uh, I don't know, um, New York or Las Vegas to have a little fun. And... Um, I, I wouldn't say that this is really part of, of human nature, and that there might be good way to be uh, good ways to to fuck around sust sustainably. Um, do you have anything to say on this? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I mean, I, I I have a whole lecture on sustainable orgy. Um, <laughs>